officer here at the Ruby Online Culinary School. Today we're having online chef office hours. This is an opportunity for all of you joining us today to uh, ask any culinary related questions. So uh, we'll be here for the next hour to uh, entertain the questions that you have, anything related to food or cooking and your course work that you're taking through Ruby. So we go ahead and just dive right in. If you have never used our live event platform it's very simple to use just right next to the video box where you see me talking you can type a question click the black ad box that puts it into a moderation queue for a quick review before we post it onto the site uh, when you do see a question posted if you like the question you can click on a little heart and that allows you to um, push the question up so we answer it just a little bit quicker so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the questions. Um, if there's a question that, um, you know, we answer and maybe we didn't give as much detail and you want to do some follow-up, that's also perfectly acceptable. So please do email us uh, directly if there's um, a question or an answer that we didn't get to uh, thoroughly respond to. Uh, first question that we have coming in from Kathleen. It says, Dr. Mercola and other, uh, some other well-known doctors advocate for coconut oil and olive oil as healthy. On the other hand, uh, believes we should eliminate whole grains and flour because they are pro-inflammatory. This is all confusing. Can you justify? So, Kathleen, I'll say, um, you know, if you have medical questions, the best thing to do is to speak with your medical doctor or the healthcare professionals that you work with. I would say that in the case of what we teach at Ruby, we typically follow whatever partner program we're working with. So for instance, within Forks Over Knives, that program very specifically follows a no oil uh, type approach. It also is an approach that definitely embraces things like whole grains and beans and other sorts of, um, of whole food plant-based type foods. So I would just say if you have questions about, you know, one medical uh, approach versus another, the best thing to do is to have your healthcare professional, the practitioner that you work with, uh, work with you directly. We're really here to provide cooking guidance so that whatever dietary approach you feel is best for yourself um, is supported with a, whatever cooking technique and cooking methods they are going to be best for you. Uh, next question, I'm taking the Forks Over Knives course. I love it. I've been uh, plant-based since 2015, completed another well-known whole food plant-based nutrition certification course, and now want to find a new career related to whole food plant-based lifestyle. What can you recommend not interested in restaurant work? So thank you, Melissa. Um, you know, we get this question a lot from students who come to us who have a definite interest in whole food plant-based. They have a passion, they know they want to use it somehow, but they're not quite sure. Um, and you know, knowing that you don't want to be in a restaurant type environment, uh, especially now, is, is a good thing to kind of um, understand for yourself. So I would say that, you know, depending on your aspirations, what you want to do, there's really a variety of things that you can look towards as possible uh, professional or career type um, you know, work that you can do with this knowledge, with the information and the sentiments, the dispositions that you get with working with us. So let's say the very first thing to think about is, you know, who are the people that you want to serve? What's the audience that you're trying to work with? Is it, um, is it more of a, you know, patient center type group, you know, people who are sick and recovering from some kind of an illness? Is it people who are in a, a fitness space or, you know, trying to maybe maximize performance? Is it a family? Is it parents and kids? Um, so figuring out the, the types of populations, the type of audience is going to be really key. Uh, you know, within that, there's all kinds of work you can do. There's private chefing work, there's food co coaching, there's consulting, there's all kinds of things that you could probably get into depending on uh, the community that you work in. And again, your other um, professional type, um, you know, information that you can provide. So if you're a health oriented type person, you know, whatever background you have in that space, 
versus uh, maybe being a fitness type person and having a certain background in that space. Um, next question, when purchasing nutritional yeast, are there certain factors to consider when making a choice? There are significant differences in cost among brands. Are the more expensive ones really better? What should I look for? You know, Carol, um, you know, I don't have a lot of experience buying, I guess, different brands that cost different things. A lot of them seem to cost around the same. The brands that I'm most familiar with buying are some of the bigger brands, Bob uh, Red Mill. Um, you know, makes nutritional yeast. I know that Bragg also makes nutritional yeast. So I think, you know, the best guidance I can offer here is just to buy one of those recognized brands um, that has a lot of reviews and a lot of ratings and things and that your natural food or your health food store might ordinarily carry. Uh, what size and type of roasting pan would you recommend? What about cookie sheets, pans? A bit leery about baking with silicone mats. Are there health studies that demonstrate their safety? So, Karen, um, I would say when it comes to using, uh, you know, a roasting pan, uh, having a large pan like an eight uh, inch by fifteen inch or something along those lines is going to be useful. Um, but I would say for most things, you just want a regular sheet pan. For home cooks, I would say what's called a half sheet pan. Uh, is going to be a great option. I would go ahead and buy a few of them. I, you know, I personally use on a regular basis, you know, three or four of those because um, I'll do a lot of roasting of vegetables and different things on a sheet pan. Um, they're not expensive, and if you're weary at all about the silicone sheets, I would just say buy regular parchment paper. You know, you can buy a big box, a hundred sheets of parchment paper for. Eight or ten dollars. It'll last you a very long time. Depending on what you're roasting, you can even reuse those parchment paper sheets. Um, and I would just start with those. I think they're going to provide a really good non-stick surface. You don't have to worry about it being, you know, um, suspect to any chemicals or anything like that. And that's going to probably be your very best thing. I would say that nine times out of ten, when I'm roasting vegetables, I'm just on a regular sheet pan. So it has a very very small lip. That goes around it, not a cookie sheet, like a flat, completely flat sheet, but a pan that's called a sheet pan that has a very, very small uh, lip around the edge. Get a half size sheet pan will fits, fits in a standard size oven. Uh, nutritional yeast has a wonderful reputation for providing uh, many B vitamins and other nutrients. I've also read that it's highly manufactured GMO flavor enhancer over time that can cause serious damage to the brain. You know, Shannon, I haven't seen that research about it causing damage to the brain. So, you know, if that's something that you want to ask your healthcare professional, your a medical doctor, some other person, uh, you might want to have a look at that information. But I haven't, I actually haven't seen that before. Hi, I'm having trouble cooking brown rice. On its own, I have a bit less of an issue, but when I try to make Mexican rice, it just does not cook. I recently cooked it for almost two hours and it never cooked well. So Susan, I think what you're referring here to is, you know, if you're doing kind of a Mexican style rice, oftentimes there's a tomato product in there. Could be a small amount of tomato sauce or tomato paste. Um, and the thing that's happening with your rice when you're trying to cook it this way is because of the acidity in the tomato product, the starches in the rice, um, are being inhibited from taking on water or liquid and swelling. So when we're talking about um, cooking rice or cooking grains, the technical term is uh, gelatinization. You're actually, it doesn't have anything to do with gelatin, but you're actually swelling those starches with liquid and um, making them plump and tender, moving them from like a hard, crunchy state to something that is gonna be tender and that you can chew that you discern as being, you know, very, very um, edible and soft. Um, and because of the acid, those starches are being inhibited from allowing the water, the liquid, into the starch of the grain and swelling. So my recommendation for you when you're, um, you know, using brown rice to make kind of a Mexican or Spanish style rice dish is I would start the rice in just water or vegetable stock. 
I would get it to a point where it's maybe two thirds of the way cooked. So not fully cooked, but start the process of getting those starches, you know, swollen and full of liquid. And then add your tomato product. So you still want to have some time for the tomato to cook with the rice, but you don't want to start the rice with the tomato because, again, it's going to inhibit the ability uh, because of the acid for those, um, those grains to get nice and soft, nice and tender. Uh, next question here. Is it necessary and or beneficial to soak chia seeds before adding them to a dish? Can you just sprinkle them on? Does heating them and simmering oatmeal negatively affect the nutritional value? I would say, Carol, you know, the best thing around chia is if you want to just put it on raw without any sort of soaking or processing, you might want to use chia powder. Um, I just find that the chia seeds sometimes are just real like small and get kind of stuck in your teeth and everything else if they're not um, treated or processed in some you know minimal way. In terms of like adding chia to oatmeal, you don't have to add it and boil it. You can just add it if you want to oatmeal that's already been simmered into the warm oatmeal. Certainly that heat that's left in residual oatmeal cooking was going to be perfectly fine for letting those chia seeds swell. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. I would say mostly just a texture thing. If you're okay with the, um, the raw seeds, then it's probably perfectly fine. But from a texture point of view, you might just want to let them soak first before you add them to things. Of course, it completely changes the texture. When you do add things, they get very sticky and have that kind of gel uh, quality to them. But it really depends what you're using it on. Uh, I tend to use chia a lot in things like salad dressings and you know, letting it spin and then sit creates kind of a thickening power for the dressing. So it, uh, it works out pretty well that way. Uh, next question here. Uh, is it possible that Ruby may do some professional baking or patisserie courses anytime? Um, so great question. So we have currently within our plant-based group of offerings a really amazing plant-based dessert course called Essential Vegan Desserts. That's with um, a woman named Fran Costigan, who's an amazing pastry chef and educator. And Fran's been teaching plant-based and vegan pastry for many, many years, 30 plus years. So we do have a course offered through Ruby with Fran uh, that we're very, very proud of in the plant-based space. We also um, right now are working on some plans to do some partnership with some non-plant-based um, organizations just to try to ramp up and get some more coverage in terms of our overall pastry and baking uh, curriculum. So stay tuned on that. Next question, do the student photos that we can access for reference for assignments show only those with perfect scores or do they reflect all ranges of scores? So Christopher, that's a really good question. We have in our courses, as you know, um, lots of what we call image upload activities. And these uh, tasks, these learning activities within the courses have a gallery to view other student work. And the question is, are those, um, is the student work that you see in that gallery just the perfect work or is it all the work? And the answer is, it's actually all the work, but it's been um, curated and then ranked um, by people so that the things that are most impressive or most highly ranked, again, by, by the audience, will show up first. So if you went to a few pages in, you might see some things that maybe don't look as, you know, as picture perfect, but certainly what we have submitted there uh, will show a range of uh, skill level, range of scores. Uh, next question. Hi there. Do you have any tips for cooking with a wok if I'm trying out recipes in the Forks Over Knives course, particularly oil-free stir fries? I have a wok in my kitchen, but I'm not sure how to use it. So, uh, Marisha, I would say that cooking um, in no oil in a wok is going to be a little bit of a challenge, especially if you're not um, already pretty adept at no oil cooking in terms of sautéing. So I would say, you know, in terms of a wok, there's going to be certain types of vegetables and certain types of things that work 
really, really well and certain things that I would just stay away from that you're probably better off using some kind of a nonstick surface for if you're really wanting to do no oil stir fry type cooking. Um, in particular, the foods that I might recommend staying away from are going to be some of those starchier foods, even things like um, par cooked noodles in a dry wok are not going to turn out very well for you. So things in a wok that work well are going to be things like carrots and broccoli and onions and celery, some of these less starchy, harder type vegetables. And of course, you're just going to want to make sure you've got a lot of heat and that you've got some vegetable stock on hand to kind of flash the pan to release um, any vegetables that might stick or little pieces of vegetables that might stick, but also to bring up the flavor that's um, going to be developing and sitting on the bottom of that pan in terms of coating the pan. So hopefully that works for you. I would recommend in some cases where people want to pull out the wok instead to pull out um, a large nonstick skillet because that's going to give you probably a better result if you have a good non-stick uh, skillet than working with a wok if you're doing uh, oil-free cooking. <laughs> um, next uh, question here. Um, uh, any surefire tips or adjustments for baking in a high-altitude climate? I'm at 6,200 feet in central Mexico. So Kevin, it really depends on what you're cooking, what you're baking. Um, I would say on the whole, because you're working in an environment that is high altitude, you're going to have um, some different cooking times and probably some different ratios in terms of the proportionality of your flour and your liquid ingredients. But really all those details have a lot to do with what you're baking. If it's um, bread baking versus, um, you know, kind of cookies, or if you're doing quick breads or other sorts of things, um, you're going to have some different ratios. So if you want to email us directly, Kevin, we're happy to help troubleshoot if there's a particular recipe or set of things that you're working on. Otherwise, I'd recommend there's some really great high altitude baking websites out there. People who are baking at above 5,000 feet or above, say, uh, you know, 2,000 meters or just under 2,000 meters is about the the uh, the altitude that people start having some some real questions. Question coming in here about vinegar: What is the sediment that forms on the bottom of the bottle, and why does white vinegar discolor over time? So, two good questions. So, number one, in the uh, vinegar bottle, you'll sometimes see over time some kind of hard or kind of hardish, even sometimes sometimes gel-like um, things that kind of form in the bottom of the bottle of the vinegar, and that essentially is what you could call the mother. It's um, essentially that thing that in you know uh, making like a, a, a kombucha, they might call it a scoby. So this is the, um, the symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast um, that creates this thick, sometimes solid, sometimes gel-like looking masses that you can see in kombucha or vinegars that you're making. Um, these are natural. Don't worry about it. They're not um, pleasing. They're not something that you want to eat, but they're something that essentially create the basis for how the vinegar is working. It's essentially the, um, you know, the equivalent of a sourdough starter, <laughs> let's just say, um, in the case of vinegar or other types of, uh, of, of liquids like that. Uh, the second part of your question, why does white wine vinegar just color over time? Well, you know, white wine vinegar is made from, ultimately, from grapes. And um, a lot of different types of fruits will go through oxidation. And, um, you know, the oxidation that we see with things like grapes are going to happen over time. And essentially what you'll see is a discoloration. So something that might be more clear or pale or straw colored might become more brown or more golden in hue because of that oxidation. So again, it doesn't really affect your, your flavor or the way it tastes unless it's very, very old. But if it's uh, some vinegar that's just been sitting for a few months, and you've noticed the, the color got a little bit darker, that's what you're seeing there. 
Next question. Hi, Ken. I was looking at an American vegan recipe that called for grits. What are grits? So grits are essentially um, a coarse form of cornmeal. In the American South, grits are primarily or most oftentimes found um, as white corn versus yellow corn, although you do see yellow corn grits. Um, it's a similar type product to polenta, although people in the South and people in Italy would both disagree <laughs> that the American Southern grits and the Italian polenta are related, but they're very, very similar in, in terms of both being um, untreated whole corn ground to a, a fairly coarse uh, type meal. Next question, I like to chop veggies ahead of time for stir frying. I'm thinking of putting broccoli, Brussels sprouts, peppers, celery, and cauliflower together. Is there a rule of thumb to go by when doing this? I would say, you know, um, those are all vegetables that you should feel really good about cutting beforehand. They're gonna withstand their shape. They're not gonna become mushy or mushy or have any issues. Um, I would say the rule of thumb is gonna really be around you know, a little bit of trial and error, what works for yourself. It's also a question of how long are you cutting them in advance? Is it just a few hours? Is it a day? Is it three days? You know, so all those things I think would probably have some impact in terms of what you ultimately do. Um, the things you kind of want to stay away from in terms of cutting are things that might uh, discolor or have an off odor. So I tend not to pre-cut onions and you know soft vegetables and things like that uh next question how do we get fresh vegetables for graded tasks when we stay home because of covid so good question kathy we're having a lot of students have um you know either product or produce delivered to them so in the united states in north america there are a lot of great services that will essentially do the shopping for you. So if you are unable or uncomfortable to go to the supermarket, um, they can bring the produce and the food directly to you. And I would say that's probably the, the primary way that our students are getting product right now if they're uncomfortable uh, because of the coronavirus going out to the store. It's probably home, home delivery. But certainly, Kathy, if you're having questions or issues about getting products or if you're not able to um, fulfill a certain activity because you can't get the product and you want to talk to someone at ruby or let us know certainly by all means you, you can do that is there an efficient way to press a lot of tofu blocks at the same time i have a tofu press but only does one at a time and i find the towel method just doesn't do a good of a job what do restaurants do so there's a lot of things that restaurants do. I've seen in restaurants people taking um, perforated sheet pans and uh, basically just tilting a perforated sheet pan so it's on an angle, putting another sheet pan on top. So you have a perforated sheet pan, you have your four or six or eight blocks of tofu, put another perforated sheet pan on top and then take something that's a weight and put it on top of that sheet pan. So sheet pan on the bottom on a slight angle so it can drain um another uh, a layer of tofu another sheet pan on top and then like a number 10 can like a heavy can or a few cans um and that's going to provide the weight and also provide the nice even surface for all those blocks of tofu i would say after you know 20 or 30 or 40 minutes um make sure it's well drained have a look at it you don't want to have too much weight so you're crushing the tofu but certainly there are a lot of ways to do more than one uh, block at the same time. Uh, next question from Alexandra. Uh, what is your favorite brand for chef knives? So Alexandra, I don't have a favorite brand. I use lots of different kinds of knives. My brands that I typically go to in terms of what I have in my, my knife drawer um, are pretty varied. I have everything from Wustoff to Kasumi to Mac uh, to Global to knives that don't have any brand at all. Uh, next question is the same one. Which uh, brand of knives would you recommend? So, uh, Lauren, I don't really recommend brands, but the ones I just mentioned are ones that um, I tend to use. But um, 
And I think for a lot of people, you just want to choose a brand that works well, that fits well in your hand, that works well for the style of cooking that you're doing, and also for budget. You know, you can spend a lot of money on a knife and you don't necessarily need to. Next question, I noticed that in many uh, videos, um, a, oops, a cast iron uh, Dutch oven is used. What's the difference between cooking in one of these versus cooking in a stainless steel uh, six quart uh, pot? So, you know, the Dutch oven, I think is gonna be a little bit different in terms of heat retention and the ability to, um, you know, have an even maintenance of heat. So the main difference between a, a heavy Dutch oven and just a, a pot is gonna be the weight. And because of the weight, you're gonna have some differences in terms of how foods might um, brown or how they might color. But otherwise, uh, very, very few differences. You can do, um, you know, I'll say all the same things depending on what you're doing uh, in those, those two different kinds of pans, 100%. Uh, next question, what is vegetarian yogurt and where would I be able to purchase it? Um, so there are lots of different types of vegan or plant-based yogurts out there in the market. Um, you can buy them at the supermarket or the health food store. They typically have a base of something like cashew or coconut or soy, and they're cultured and fermented just like regular yogurt, but instead of using a dairy milk, a cow milk, for instance, it uses the milk from uh, soy milk or almond milk or some other kind of nut milk. So that's the main, the main difference there. Next question. Hi, Ken, do you think it's necessary for a plant-based home cook to have a food processor? I don't have one yet, but would invest in one if you think it would make a big difference. I have a powerful Ninja blender. Yeah, I would say food processor and blender do very different things. So food processor to me is gonna be better for thicker pastes and purees and things where you don't want it to be maybe as liquid as you would see in a blender. So things like hummus and bean pastes that are less likely to flow in a blender context might be better in a food processor. Food processors also have the ability to do grating and grinding and other sorts of things that you couldn't do in a blender. So I think it's a good thing to have. Um, I don't recommend lots and lots of kitchen tools. I think you can do a lot in a kitchen with a fairly small number of tools. But I would say, you know, on the short list for sure, uh, food processor. Not not a bad thing to have at all. I, I have one. I use it um, all the time, every week for sure. Uh, next question. Yesterday I tried to saute garlic in water rather than oil in hopes to wilt spinach after the garlic brown. The garlic didn't brown without the oil that I normally use. How to get the garlic, uh, that nice browning on the garlic without oil. So I would say, Allison, if you're in our Forks Over Knives course, I would simply review the um, oil-free um, recipes for you know sauteing without oil. I would say when it comes to something like garlic, you're going to want to start in a um, fairly, you know, medium heat pan, nothing too hot because you don't want to scorch or burn the garlic. You're going to want to add your garlic to a pan without any water in it and move it around quickly. You'll begin to hear it and smell it. You're going to want to have water or vegetable stock on the ready immediately because once that garlic begins to really smell and it take on some color, it'll even notice in the bottom of the pan sometimes some coloration, that's when you want to release it with some vegetable stock or some water. If you just add water and garlic in a pan together, it'll never brown, simply because of the liquid, because of the water. Um, the pan will never get at that point hotter than the boiling temperature, so you can't brown food um, with a boiling type temperature. Uh, Mary Jo would like to know how to make soy milk. So I would say, uh, Mary Jo, what you want to do is you want to go online and find a start to finish soy milk recipe, but very high level soy milk is made from soaking and grinding and then pressing, um, soybeans. So it's a very, very simple process. It's literally just dried soybeans that you soak, cook, puree or grind, and then press to extract a lot of the flavor and then you know some of the very, very, very fine solids. 
And that's what's going to give your soy milk some body and give it, um, you know, the ability to have just a, a rich soy type flavor. Um, next question here has to do with chopping nuts. So um, if a recipe calls for one cup chopped nuts, I assume that I measure the walnuts after I chop them. But sometimes a recipe will say one cup walnuts slash chopped. Uh, do I measure the walnut halves and then chop them? So I would say chop them first and then measure them. You want to make sure that in the measuring cup you have chopped walnuts. That's going to be your best bet in terms of uh, measurement. Next question coming in from Sunny is my Le Crusade Dutch oven the same as a casserole dish? Um, you know, they're not the same. The Dutch oven is going to be a lot deeper. Casserole dish has a wide variety of depths. It could be anywhere from maybe an inch all the way to three or four inches. Um, so I'd say they're not the same, but they can be used in the same way. Um, the Dutch oven is great because it has the ability to have a nice tight fitting lid, whereas a lot of casserole dishes don't have a lid. They're open. Next question, what type of non-stick skillet do you recommend? There are so many types of coatings. I'm not sure uh, if one will scratch or become ineffective in short time and be a waste of money. I don't mind paying more for a more effective and longer lasting skillet. So I would say, Monica, there's a lot of um, different non-stick technologies out there. The thing that you want to look for are going to be, you know, really technologies that are going to be more green and not have that whole you know list of chemicals that you used to see when you're buying Teflon pans. And by and large, most of them are very, very green these days. But spend the extra money, get kind of a, a green pan uh, or a scan pan or a ceramic type coating. Even if it says that you can use metal utensils and all those other things, don't. You're going to want to stick to wood or other uh, types of soft utensils. Um, treat them very, very well. With my non-stick pans that I have, I just wash them with just a tiny bit of soap and water and make sure I, I air dry them or wipe them out with a clean cloth. I don't put them through the dishwasher. I don't stack stuff in them. You just want to treat them really nice so that the um, interior of the pan doesn't get uh, you know compromised in any way. Next question, can cashew cream be frozen? Absolutely. So Carol, what you want to do with cashew cream when you're freezing it is you want to divide it into small containers. So maybe eight ounces or 12 ounces max. You don't want to have you know big quart containers of it. So small containers, because what you're trying to do is actually facilitate easy uh, thawing. You want to go from frozen to thawing as quick and as easy as possible. If you have a really big mass of cashew uh, cream, it's going to take a long time to thaw. It's going to reaffect the way it gets reheated. Can you give some examples of how you would use agar in savory dishes? The only recipes I have have come to mind are desserts. So I would say agar could be used um, in you know savory applications as well. I would say most of the things people use it for tend to be sweet. But if you wanted to do, you know, any sort of a savory filling or any sort of a thing where you wanted some body and you didn't necessarily want it to be, um, you know, eaten warm, agar can provide some body in a cold setting. Um, you can do, you know, things like savory um, uh, plant-based quiches or tarts and things. And in those cases, a little bit of agar might help set or bind. But I would say most of the applications I see personally are also in the dessert category. Can you please elaborate a bit on heat control? For example, many recipes state to heat up a pan or pot to a certain temperature, like medium heat. Can I heat on high temp and then reduce to medium so it goes faster? Is this not a good idea? No, that's absolutely fine. If you want to get your pan hot um, fast, then turn it up you know, all the way, nice hot temperature then turn it down when you're doing a medium temperature, you know, dry heat, uh, uh, dry saute or medium heat or something like that. So absolutely, temperature control is going to be key. But if you're just trying to heat your pan, by all means, just turn it up, right? And then make sure you turn it back down when you when you need to. You don't want to, uh, if you're doing like dry sauteing, for instance, you want to have it be too hot. 
Next question, when would you use the convection option on an oven? So really good question here. I would say that um, I use the convection option most of the time. <laughs> um, there's not a lot of examples where I don't want convection. Convection for me just provides overall a lot better um, browning, a lot more even heating, and just provides a more consistent type cooking because the fan equalizes a lot of the differences that might come from being on the top rack or the bottom rack or not turning your pan around or things like that. So convection just helps equalize cooking. Um, if you're doing a lot of cooking and have an oven full of food in particular, it's gonna be very, very useful. Another on heat control, when adding vegetables to cooking liquid, it often stops simmering. What do I do? Increase the temp to turn it back on to simmering and then lowering or let it be. I'm worried about overcooking uh, if I let it come back on low temperature. So yeah, if you're like simmering vegetables or part cooking vegetables in water, I'd just bring those to a boil. I'd add my vegetables, knowing that it's gonna drop the temperature significantly. And then once it comes back to the simmer, turn it down and maintain the simmer. So I wouldn't, you know, have it on medium, add my vegetables, and then just expect it to recharge if I'm looking for it to recharge a lot faster. So certainly turn the heat up if you're looking for it to recharge faster. Next question is about steam ovens. They have the possibility to add a percentage of humidity to the hot air function. What is that for? Normal steaming is of course 100% humidity um 100 degrees celsius but does it make sense to add humidity in higher temperatures so yeah i mean you want humidity is going to add in some cases for instance with baked goods it's going to add a lot different results and better outcome if you have humidity in the oven along with just the heat so humidity is going to help carry the heat a little bit more it's also going to help with things like bread baking or making certain kinds of pastries um, to create a nice exterior uh, texture and a, and a kind of a, a glossiness or a coating in some ways. But I would say, you know, overall, um, the humidity is going to be a good thing, um, especially if you're just trying to not dry things out. Sometimes when I do roasted vegetables and things, I want them to be, you know, browned, but also not super, super dehydrated feeling. Um, three easiest and still healthy vegan whole food plant-based dishes you recommend for home cooking. So, you know, I have my go-tos. I do a lot of um, black bean soup is one of my favorites. And we're pretty heavy on the garnishes here. So, in fact, I need to make some more this week. But very, very plain black beans cooked with just a ton of onions and garlic and cumin and some chili powder. We like to make that into a soup. To that, we can fold in, um, you know, pieces of roasted butternut squash or green vegetables. You can serve it over rice or some other grain, or just serve it over a big bowl of greens is also delicious. Um, we do a lot of lentils also, so we like lentils as a puree, and lentils as a soup, lentils as a stew with root vegetables is delicious. I also do a lot of work with um, wild rice. I'm a huge fan of wild rice. Um, I love wild rice in particular with wild mushrooms. It's a great combination. So wild rice, wild mushrooms, tons of shallots, finish it with um, scallions or chives. Just really, really delicious. Oh, the other wild rice dish I'll do in the summertime is a wild rice and cucumber salad, which is also really, really delicious. I do that kind of Japanese style with cucumbers, wild rice, and sesame. Um, really, really delicious. Next question, what's the best type of vegetable steamer? There are so many out there uh, that have mixed reviews and I don't know which one to buy. So Monica, I would say that the simplest way to st steam vegetables is either in an insert. Um, so in other words, you have a big pot and there's an insert that goes inside the pot with a lid. That's one easy way. I would say the other way is just to use a, a steamer basket for a home cook type situation. Um, that's going to be also pretty pretty easy. The, the big thing around steaming is just to make sure that you have a steamer that works well for you. And I, I know a lot of families who use bamboo steamers because the bamboo steamer is very expandable. 
it allows for the ability to have um, you know maybe just a small amount of steamed vegetables one night or if you stack them you know three or four tall you can have a lot more steamed vegetables the for the next day I'm trying to figure out the proportion of water to cook medium grain brown rice if I soak and sprout it first I'm currently using one and a half cups of water per one cup rice and it takes one and a half hours to cook which is a long time um, you know, I would say if you soak your rice um, for any period of time, really anything more than just a few hours, you should be able to reduce the cooking time uh, of that product. So, for instance, in my experience with soaking brown rice and sprouting, you know, maybe you do a, an overnight sort of a situation, uh, but those will become fairly hydrated. And then instead of a one and a half water to one cup rice, I'll actually typically do a little bit closer to one to one. I can find in some cases where it's just too much liquid and um, depends on how long I soak and sprout first, but it could be too much liquid. It can actually, actually cause the rice to be too, too mushy or too blown out. Uh, but I would say on the whole, if you do a long soak, be pretty close to one to one, maybe one and a half to one, depending on the rice. But it shouldn't take more than about 40 minutes to cook in the case of brown rice after that. When I print out the recipes in the Forks Over Knives course, the print is too small. I have tried to choose the option of having an email to me so I can print in a Word document and change the font, but never get an email with the recipe. Can you explain? Carol, if you can um, reach out to us directly, our student services team would love to find a way to help you um, with your printer and your recipe uh, questions. Next question here. Can you please explain the difference between dark grade A maple syrup and amber grade A? Amber seems to be easier to find, but Chef Fran, the pastry chef, recommended dark. Is there a time to use each? You know, I would say the difference between them is going to be fairly small. The dark tends to have a little bit more of a robust character or robust flavor, more of kind of a, a strong maple flavor, I would say. Amber is going to work perfectly fine too. I find that for myself, when I buy, you know, grade A or grade B or amber or dark, you know, very, very similar products overall. Um, I'm sure if I were to do a side by side tasting, I'd have a difference. Uh, but when you're putting into a baked good or some other product, uh, you may or may not be able to actually um, taste the difference at all when it's all done. Next question, I've always bought um, spices in jars from the store, but considering switching to buying in bulk and buying wider mouth containers to accommodate all sizes of measuring spoons. Uh, any recommendations? Um, you know, I don't have any recommendations. I would say whatever containers you buy, just make sure that they're nice and airtight, that they're easy to handle. Um, if you can get containers that aren't clear, that's also helpful because, um, you know, you want to maintain spices in the absence of sunlight, but if they're going to be in a cupboard behind a door, it doesn't matter. Uh, next question here, suggestions and resources for canning fresh tomatoes and peppers. Uh, gosh, I don't really have any um, suggestions other than that you should do it and that, um, you know, when you're in a mode where you're doing a lot of canning, you're just going to want to find your workflow. That's the big thing for me when I get into canning every year is I have to get my setup and my workflow. And then once I get that, um, you can start doing a lot of production. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. Next question. Good morning, all. Ken, I know it's been, uh, it's given that a change for a recipe in a recipe alters the flavor of the food when a recipe calls for Madeira and I don't have that. How would the flavor change if I use Merlot? Um, so, you know, Merlot is going to give it a lot more of a kind of classic red wine type flavor, whereas Madeira is a fortified wine that has some sweetness to it, kind of a nuttiness, um, just a different flavor component. So I would say if you can't find Madeira and you want to substitute uh, Merlot, it's probably okay, depending on the recipe, but it will have a fairly significant uh, change of flavor because Merlot and Madeira just taste so different. Next question, if we don't receive a passing score on the knife task, are we able to retake or revise for a better score? Yes, so in many of the tasks that you'll see in our courses, Jamila, 
you will see a Supreme Court. It looks like a gavel icon. And if you want to do something again, just tap the Supreme Court. That'll give you an opportunity to, uh, to do it again. I'm making seasonal bread like berry bread um, uh, with oat and quinoa flowers and coconut milk. Uh, why does it turn out dry? Is adding more liquid to the recipe the secret? You know, I, I have to look at your formula to really figure it out. But if it's dry, it could be that you're not adding enough liquid. You might want to add something like a nut butter or something that has some fat in it. Or you might want to check your cooking times. It could be that you're cooking it too long. When I am cooking a meal where I am browning a meat and sauteing vegetables, what should it be the order of execution? Kevin, I would say follow the recipe that you're trying to use. Um, in most cases, you want to make sure that your pan is very hot to achieve browning and that you're also not um, crowding your pan. The biggest things when browning anything has to do with the temperature that your pan uh, is set at and then the ability for you to execute that without having any crowding of the pan that would create ultimately kind of more of a steaming activity versus a browning or a dry heat cooking type uh, outcome. Next thing that we have here, um, although I generally cook at home during this time uh, of stay at home, I also want to support local restaurants, which means ordering online and pickup. Do you have any suggestions on terms to use and in special instructions to comply with whole food plant base. Um, gosh, I would just say, you know, the biggest thing is find a few restaurants or food carts that you like. I would literally just call them up and say, here's what I like to eat. Here's my restrictions. You know, what can I order off the menu? I would say in this day and age, they should be very, very happy to accommodate whatever kind of special need or special offer. Uh, next question, what can be done to remove the gas from beans? So yeah, beans can be a little bit gaseous for people. I would say there's a variety of different techniques that people have used. One is soaking them beforehand. Some people find that to be beneficial. Some people find that just eating more beans and building up the capacity in your body to digest those sugars is another answer. Um, there's also all kinds of other things that people cook with beans. So in Mexico, they might use something like epazote. In Japan, they might use some sort of seaweeds. But there might be some things that you cook the beans with to help reduce some of that gassiness. But otherwise, I'll say just um, you know go ahead and make sure they're nice and soaked. Uh, make sure they're thoroughly cooked. And uh, you know, the more beans you eat, the more your body is going to be able to process those. Hi, Chef Ken. Uh, we, uh, when told to soak cashews and then put them in the food processor to help make things creamy, can you substitute the cashew for different types of nuts? I have not been able to find raw cashews anywhere in my area. Um, you know, yes and no, Rosie. I would say that depending on the nut that you're using, some are going to make a nice creamy sauce and some won't. So something like a pine nut or a macadamia nut that's higher in fat might work really well. But in general, I would say if you can find cashews or order cashews, they're going to be your very, very best option. Um, you recommended using a non-skid stick skillet for no oil cooking, but Forks Over Knives video show just a good stainless steel pan. It was recommended I purchase a stainless steel pan instead of non-stick. So absolutely, Carol, you're going to want to buy a good stainless steel pan, and we'll teach you how to use that stainless steel pan in Forks Over Knives. But some people still prefer using a nonstick. They're absolutely designed to be a slick surface. And in the absence of oil, um, they are still easier for some people to work with. So I would say go, go do both. Um, but certainly we will teach you how to use a stainless steel pan uh, in the Forks Over Knives uh, course. Task 41, rearranging the order of things on a computer. I just have an iPad, so I don't have that ability. Um, you know, reach out to our customer service team. I think that depending on the version of the iPad or the software that you're running, there might be a fix for that. But um, a computer is going to be your easiest bet here. Next question. I'm not sure who's grading my task 125. I forgot to mention that I use Lime because I'm intolerant to lemons. Okay. Monica, you might want to send that email to us at customer service. 
Um, there's no easy way for me to <laughs> convey that information right now during our live event. I would like a creamy type of navy bean soup. The broth stays clear and separate from beans and veggies. What can I do? So simply puree a cup or two of those beans, put them in a blender, and then blend that back in with your soup. You'll be amazed how creamy it gets and how thick it gets. But that's your best bet. Anytime you take a bean and you mash it or puree it, it's going to make things opaque and creamy and thick. Is eating mushroom raw better than cooking it? How about the probiotic values? I would say most mushrooms do better cooked. Some people have intolerances to raw mushrooms. I would say in most cases, uh, cook your mushrooms. You're going to get better flavor and better outcomes. Hi, Ken. There have been several different studies, positive and negative, about the use of microwave. What are some ways for reheating food without the use of a microwave? So depends on the food. You know, you can reheat via steam. You can reheat in the oven. You can reheat in a pan that's covered over gentle heat. A lot of it depends on what you're reheating. If it's a super stew, just put it back into a small pan and just uh, turn it on and simmer it. Uh, next question here. I've been reading a lot of blogs and websites, getting more information about this. But do you have any tips for making a more airy sourdough bread? Mine has been coming up very dense. I have been adding, I have not been adding any instant yeast, only sourdough starter. So I would say, Alexandra, if your sourdough is too dense, it is probably not hydrated enough. I would say sourdough or really any bread has to be very, very moist, a lot more wet than you feel comfortable handling in most cases. So it should be just dry enough to handle so it's not sticking to your hands and even sometimes still sticking to your hands. So it sounds like your sourdough is just too dry You've added too much flour, not enough water. Could also be that your sourdough is not active enough. Your starter is not active enough, meaning it's not producing enough gas to create those pockets and those big pillows of air uh, when you're cooking the cooking the the, the, the bread. Um, next question here: Can you use self-rising flour in sourdough recipe? Uh, Asked Jane. Uh, no, you don't want to. You want to use regular bread flour when you're making sourdough, not anything self-rising. Next question, when measuring out quantities of viscous ingredients, specifically for baking, do you try to take into account the admittedly small portion of the ingredient that will not transfer out of the implement? Yeah, you know, if something's like really thick, syrupy, or like a, a batter or something like that that you're trying to measure, you could overestimate maybe 5 or 10%, knowing that there might be some stuck in the measuring container afterwards. I would say give it a shot, but don't worry too much about it. You want to get very, very close without being 100% precise necessarily. Next question, can you describe the benefits or features of cooking in clay pots versus ceramic coated cast iron pots? So, you know, a big clay pot, um, very much like a ceramic or a, uh, a coated cast iron pot, an enameled cast iron pot, We'll call it going to be fairly similar. A big clay pot, depending on what you're cooking in, is also going to hold heat very well. It's going to retain heat very well. Um, again, I would just probably ask what it is you're cooking. Um, but by and large, because they're both very heavy, they're going to have a lot of shared traits or consistent traits between the two. Looks like that's all the questions we have for today. We went almost a full hour. So thank you so much for joining us. If you had a question that we didn't get to or didn't get to fully answer, please do reach out to us directly. You can email us at studentservices at ruby.com. Or if you have a specific question for one of your chef instructors, you can reference um, their names in the email as well. We're always happy to help. Until next time, we look forward to seeing you in class. And take care. Happy cooking. Be well.